Excuse me. <clears throat> What's going on, Mark Vanderwall, the one and only? What's going on, man? It's been a while. <laughs> well, I know I know we recorded a lot when I was there, so there was a lot that you could put on YouTube, but technically we haven't done one of these in a few weeks. It's been, I think it's been almost a month since we sat down in this format. I mean, you were out here uh, two weeks ago, and I can't thank you enough for, um, you know, co-piloting the, the Reef Studio Tour. I felt like that was the best way to present the studio and yeah, man, two hours is still like it's, it's still so fast to just yeah. zoom by every tank. Um, yeah, that and then was a fun. podcast, man. You worked, you worked <laughs> for a day. I, I, I want to, you. To, I want to promise you. Next time you come out, I won't force you to do all no, of that. But it was a good time. I just need. I needed you. Uh, I needed you there. No, it was good. I, I I had fun. You know. I mean, it was it was us geeking out for a whole day. Uh, it it didn't feel like work to me. So my voice um, was a little raspy at the end because we'd done so much talking, but you know, that was a good thing. Yeah, me too. I was so faded by the end of that day that I wanted to make sure to like re-listen to that whole recording to make sure, you know, it was all kosher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but uh, I know there's a lot of anxious listeners uh, who are interested in our thoughts on probably the there biggest news Sorry. of the year. Yeah. Uh, bulk resupplies purchase of um neptune systems but uh i feel like there's a you know just a couple things i want to tell you about uh before we we dive into the deep end and uh try to give a, a more measured um i, I guess a, opinion about what's going on okay let's dive in i'm good i have a blind purple tile fish oh what happened I, f I, I don't know what happened, but even when you were here, there was the four purple tiles. Yeah. And uh, from day one, there was this one of the four specimens who would let himself just kind of be, you know, sucked up gently by the power filter. Yeah. Um, either at the surface or on the bottom. And when I would feed, he would kind of come out like, you know, he could smell it in the water, but he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't eat. And um, after, man, I think I've had this, these fish for four weeks or six weeks, I finally realized that he's blind. The other oh, three man. eat just fine. They're super good weight. Um, but, he, yeah, his eyes are totally fine. And I mean, this is not, I would say it's rare, but it's not unheard of. Yeah. And, um, but I have figured out that when I feed, he goes into this one particular corner and I've started tapping on the glass very gently, um, with the metal tweezers, just when I, the, the, what I use to pinch the, the, the mice, the frozen mice shrimp. And he'll, he'll go to this one particular corner where the food will end up. And it's so funny, like, you know, seeing him basically kind of run his mouth along the bottom, waiting to 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 like run into pieces of mice that are on the ground and so i have to feed like a, a lot of food to that tank so he has enough because the other three purple tiles will just go straight for it They'll yeah just, boom, just zoom for it and it's so like it's so amusing watching him eat because you know a big chunk of mice could be like one millimeter from his mouth to the left or to the right and he'll just turn the wrong way i'm like no you're almost <laughs> there <laughs> it's weird having the most entertainment from a blind fish, <laughs> from a blind fish. So he's a little skinnier, skinnier than the others. Um, I think what I'm gonna end up doing is putting him maybe in a five gallon tank or a 10 gallon tank by himself and see if I can figure out a way to, to, to train him to eat more deliberately because otherwise he's a beautiful looking specimen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're already <clears throat> partially there with the training, right? So mm -hmm. if he's starting to mm -hmm. respond to you tapping the glass and I just wonder how, how stuff like that how always happens. Because I know they're notorious jumpers. Maybe he, he bonked against something a bit too hard. or If if he did, it didn't happen on my end. Because, yeah. I mean, just the other day, we, we wanted to scrape the tank uh, that they're in and clean it up. And um, we drained the water in that system by half because we knew what we were in for. And even with the water drained like halfway, um, one of them managed to bonk his head on the glass <laughs> lid keeping him in yeah. and he, his eye was swollen for about two days you know no infection no hemorrhaging or anything um but it's since it has gone back down <clears> so yeah those whew, those guys are like i think they're worse than eels but you're worse than eels they're worse than than jawfish they're worse than firefish worse than wrasses just 
but on the flip side they're they are at the surface kind of spitting water a little bit and like begging for food and they're like they're like fun little puppy dogs as long as you can keep in in the tank right that's cool yeah i i had two fish go missing um it's a it's a bummer because they were like the probably my two favorite fish but uh between going down to florida and dealing with the family stuff and then coming to colorado and then shortly after colorado i did that uh i went on a a backpack fly fish trip in wyoming so it was three whole weeks where either my wife was taking care of the tank or you know i was having a neighbor stop by but uh it it, is funny you come back and you're like looking at your tank and and the first thing you think is like everything looks healthy there's no algae outbreak all the corals are thriving and mm-hmm. it was like three days later, I was like, hey, wait, my mystery rash is gone. Um, and oh, then, no. yeah, I was bummed about that guy. And, and a Rainford eye uh, Gobi is, well, he's been cryptic, so maybe he's around, but I just haven't seen him. So, bit mm. of a bummer, but, and I mean, everybody did a good job feeding them, so I, I don't know. You know, hard right. to say what happened. They may have. What do you think? Uh, do you think the mystery rass might have jumped out while someone was feeding? I, I'm worried. Well, I mean, I you know, I I fully disclosed that I don't think of, I've got that four inch lip of glass, and I was oh. I had no illusions of that keeping jumpers in the tank wholeheartedly. But I do wonder, while my while the rest of my family was home, like maybe he jumped and my dog picked him up as a snack or something. Because oh, <laughs> I looked yeah. around the back of the tank and everywhere. Uh, I looked in the overflow box, and he's nowhere to be found. So. Oh, here's a, here's a funny kind of gross story. I uh, <laughs> uh, in college at my, my my spot over in Columbia, South Carolina, mm-hmm. um, I had a um, mandarin goby, a dragonette, and uh, one day I noticed that he was missing, and I didn't I didn't have any cats, I didn't have any dogs, I didn't have anything that would eat him, and I was just like, you know, I'm bare bottom, so there's not really any place for him to like just get decomposed by the sand or stuck in a power head or or not a lot of cleanup crew to just like take him apart so i was convinced he jumped out so i looked all over the tank and couldn't find him anywhere and in that room i had my african gray who um she shed a very fine layer of dander uh on a dark dark hardwood floors and it was about two weeks later i noticed these uh little little tracks in her dander that were oh. not bird tracks it was a rat it was a full-blown rat in my and not, not a small one it was a big one too man there's a crazy story of how i found him and caught him but like it was weeks later i was able to piece together that the rat probably <laughs> ate the dried up uh <laughs> um mandarin goby that was crazy that's a, that's a gross story <laughs> no yeah rats are uh we we uh they tore down some old houses near my old house many years ago when i lived in a, a different house and I think they unleashed like a rat's nest because all of a sudden everybody had rat like a rat in their attic, right? And so no, I can relate, man. They're nasty creatures. Um, yeah, but I mean they're just serving a role, just like bristle worms, part yeah. of the ecosystem, whether you like it or not. Spreading the plague, you know. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. So I also got some uh, some new fish. Um, let's see, about a week and a half ago, I got a shipment of xanthic eyebly angelfish and it was so strange because we've seen um aberrant color forms of like coral beauties before i think it's like primarily coral beauties um once in a while by color would come up uh, aberrant but i don't think we've ever seen these solid yellow eyebly angelfish and something about the xanthic quality just made their orange stripes like really really bright very pretty fish what i'm blown away by was the number of them that were caught at when you first sent me that picture i thought is somebody captive breeding these right like bali or somebody because what are the odds of 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 acquiring a, that number of xanthic species of fish in in a well even in just one location right it's it's mm-hmm. an, i think it was a location thing yeah i think it would be very similar to how there's like big batches of uh koi scopus tangs once in a while yeah they're, they're, they're found in one spot but the the koi scopus they change but their color usually gets kind of y- more interesting or brighter or just moves from one spot to another um but these eyebelies there was like a whole spectrum ranging from like normal eyebelies that were just a little bit brighter all the way to the full-blown just golden yellow just most striking fish 
really amazing specimen. So I was sent three of them um, by Reef Pro. So one was a normal, which I would call like maybe just a premium eye So it just looked like a, an eye with a saturation turned up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, another one that was very odd. He's, he's like really dark on top with um, like a yellow face and yellow belly and a lot of yellow markings. So he's got more black and more yellow. Really strange. But then I got the you know, the solid golden eye and man, I, I, I just knew that those fish were going to change colors. Um, but yeah, the Xantic golden started darkening up like almost instantly. Oh, I, wow. I've been taking pictures every single day. And um, it's, at first it looked like, like smoke, like a weird smoky gradient on them. And on him, because the, the what I call the premium eye blight didn't change color, the half and half didn't change color, so he's still like the most mutated one. And then the golden, now he's got like this weird, uh, uh, like a gr- gray layer over the golden coloration underneath. So there's the xanthism is still there, and the colors are still br- some of the colors are still bright, but now the gray sheen over him makes him look a little greenish. Hmm. So he's nothing like when he came in, but, um, you know, that's to be expected. It's pretty well documented in like the, the coral beauties that some people get. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting so. to document that over time, especially to see where they end up, you know, mm-hmm. um, similar mm-hmm. to the koi tangs, right? They, they tend to change over time a bit as well. Well, that's the other, the flip side of the coin is if it can change color to a darker fish, maybe some stimulus or some time will enable the fish or encourage the fish to revert back to the golden coloration. Yeah. That's the, the, the real uh, $10,000 question. That's, that's one of the, the more interesting things, I think. Yeah, it'd be cool if there was some type of environmental stimulus that happened in that location at a time where there were a lot of juveniles or something that sort of triggered that. But I, You know, I have to... I have to believe that there's a. <laughs> you got a buddy. Fly, fly. <laughs> yeah. I have to believe that there's a genetic component, right? Because I have the piebald one, and then the norm one's a little bit juiced. But something, some combination of genetics and environmental factors was either keeping them yellow or making them go yellow. Yeah. It, it's hard to know. It's really hard to know. Yeah. That's a nice pickup, though. That's those are some cool fish. Hey, you know, I've, li- I've loved, uh, you know, the candy stripe angelfish since I was a kid because, you know, obviously the peppermint is unobtainium for all but the, the richest stock traders and, and brain surgeons or whatnot. And so I always, like, really enjoyed the subtle beauty of that particular species. And I just happened to have a, what I call, a, I call him normie now because he's normal compared to the others. So I already had one. And so the, what I call the, the, the premium eye bli is in with the normal one. And it's really interesting to have them uh, all together. But I- if you look really carefully, man, they, did, they got a, a, a blue iris, a, an orange eye ring, a cute little mouth, bright orange pelvic fins. And as they get mature, they have a bright orange pelvic area. And then the, the degree and the patterning of the orange bars uh, on the side, or the th- they're actually thin stripes, um, varies a lot by individual and as they get older like th- it builds up a little bit towards the top of the head and if you have a male you know he's gonna have a little bit longer fins they're black and the tail is edged in blue so there's a lot going on in, in, a, in a small package of a fish but the normal one that I got was traded into a store because he eats coral so yeah, I have to go out of way I've, I've tried one once uh, just because I was feeling a bit gutsy and man was he uh he like for me lemon peels and eyeblies are just the worst in terms of coral safety yeah. with with yeah. pygmies um which is a shame because like you i've always liked them because they have such a such ornate pattern right like it's mm-hmm. it's not just an all yellow fish or this or that it, it's like a very interesting pattern that you can get them the tiger pige that was a cool fish too that i remember i i would have if there were more of them and I could afford them, I would have happily like set up a small fish only with live rock for a guy like that. Cause that was a cool looking yeah, fish too. The the tiger pygy is definitely one of my holy grail fish, you know. And these guys are so close; they're so close to yeah. that. But but a tiger pygy, you know, its color will mature, but it's not going to revert any particular way. And you know, to me, like the tiger pygy is a fish I've seen a couple times. 
Um, and they're just they're just so interesting, and they just remind me of looking at um, some of the original Angelfish books from the late 90s that you know showed this crazy looking fish that was similar to what we were familiar with but at once also completely different Mm -hmm. and so it's just one of those um truly truly holy grail fish from my childhood yeah uh, it's up there with mine as well um and it's a cool to me what i liked about uh, not you know not the twenty thousand dollar uh peppermint angels but you know i don't know uh $3,000 $3,000 is not cheap for a fish, but it's the idea that you wouldn't have to set up this 200 gallon system to keep something mm-hmm. rare, you know, and keep something yeah. cool and unique. Uh, I always thought, you know, hey, if you ever fall into some money, that'd be kind of a cool setup is you could you could go with something like that. And if they were available and, and you could get away with it in like a 65 gallon tank, you know, and do yeah, it up real absolutely. nice. And so um, that was a. Uh, the Japanese angelfish book, like some of the example tanks that they had in the back, right? Like mm-hmm. where they created these little biotope systems for pygmy angels. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't just have it. I have it like at arm's length. I always love those. And like the Japanese filters were always so crazy, you know, like they had like the, they, they always had like the big wet dry. They love their ETS skimmers back in the day. Mm-hmm. Like they, they, yeah. were, they still do. Yeah. They still do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I always loved uh, how they, they mixed and matched lots of different spotlights. Mm. Before they were LED, they, had, they would use compact fluorescence or these like mini metal halides that would just screw into a socket with some kind of a, you know, specialized bows, but it really allowed them to fine tune the colors of the tank in a way that we're only now just being able to do with, you know, hyper controllable LED spotlights. <laughs> I'm not trying to plug the A500X, but man, that thing is a, is a different beast. You know, you and I can do that because we have one. We yeah. Have them. Yeah. Yeah. It re- I think you, you hit it on the head there. Maybe part of my romance with that a500 is it it sort of brings me back to those japanese tanks with the spotlights mm. yeah yeah so. i have a whole led spotlight collection um some of them i used on my first led lit tank it was like a four gallon cube there's a, a cut it was a eco reef one so i did there's two videos on youtube of that thing that was my first led lit you know reef tank and that was also the first tank i ever did without any live rock that thing was all um all ceramic but i still to this day have some corals that were in that tank very proud of that nice yeah so speaking of books i went to i actually went to a coral show this past weekend the uh, coral farmers market to offload some corals and just like you know interface with the community and i brought out some of the um the RAS books that yeah. reef builders printed a few years ago and so many people came came up to m- the booth and like oh my god racism that was my favorite i just got you know three labooties or oh man i'd love to have this for the store and i you know selling them at 75 dollars and it let cheaper for what i call industry folks just you know so, just so they can have it and like we didn't print this book to make money. We just did it because it seemed cool, and Rudy Kiter approached us about it. Do you know how many copies I sold, bro? How many? One. What? I sold one copy of the definitive, ra- uh, definitive reference to most people's favorite group of fishes. It's like they, you know, the thing about a book, it's like it will never die, and you will learn some cool stuff. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not harping on anybody in particular, uh, but I, it, it is a testament to how people feel they can get pretty much all their information online. You know, I don't have this library here just for, for fun. When anytime I'm writing about a particular species of, of fish or corals or crustaceans, or I, I always pull out a book to have you know, something concrete about where the, the, the animal comes from, what depth, um, you know, male, female differences, any fun anecdotes that might come from it that you won't find online. You know, I always draw an analogy to music because it used to be like you'd buy a CD because you heard a song that you liked and then you'd listen to the CD and eventually one of the tracks that you always skipped over be suddenly over time grows on you and becomes your favorite song, right? Mm-hmm. Or the albums that are probably my most favorite albums of all time uh a lot of them i didn't like when i first bought them and then i would just Mm -hmm. continue to just pop them in from time to time and listen to them and then 
they grew on me, but because it took longer for me to warm up and like them, it seems like the effect, the the resonance of liking them lasts longer, right? It does, mm-hmm. like I'm not over it and bored with it. And <clears throat> fish books uh, were a lot like that for me where, you know, you're looking up that your favorite fish and you're scanning past all this other, all these other fish, but then over time as you pass through like certain fish like you start to draw interest to those fish that you could care less about and then suddenly those become your favorite fish um Mm -hmm. and that's sort of lost when you're like just you know spot treating the information that you're going after right you're just saying i just want to look up this exact fish there's less of that discovery um yeah and that's a shame um you know, it's the same with music now, you know, like now you just go to Spotify and you listen to the artist one track and you don't really spend the time to listen to the whole album. And you know what? God, that song know. you may hate, you may love like six weeks from now and it'll be your favorite song of all time. <laughs> so. I've been on Spotify for about 10 years since yeah. before it was tied into Facebook. I remember I remember learning about this, this music service uh, a long time ago. I pre-signed up for it before it was actually available. And I guess now over 10 years, they probably got a thousand dollars. I'm like, man, that's, that's really cheap. But I don't think I've listened to any full albums in a long time, but just to kind of get back to on track with the fish books, um, you know, I recently got this awesome golden Hamlet. There's no information out there on this golden Hamlet, right? Yeah. I have a Caribbean fish ID guide that tells you a little bit about them, but Scott Michael's books, man. One thing I really still love about them to this day is there's a lot of anecdotes because, uh, Scott w- you know, he would have photographed a lot of these fish himself. He would have seen them in the wild. He would have done his research. And there's an awesome, you know, mention in there about the golden Hamlet of how it seems to have a, a little bit of a concentration in this one particular reef in Nicaragua. And then I was able to go to Google scholar and type in the species name for the golden Hamlet in Nicaragua and just find out all this information about, you know, this fish is wide ranging and Caribbean, but there's just one spot in Nicaragua where the, you know, most of the Hamlets are goldens. Just absolutely fascinating stuff. So Scott, Scott led the breadcrumb trail there. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing that, that people don't have forgotten about books is, uh, you know, they can lead you to more information that's in the book. And, you know, a real book has a lot of references and literature cited um, within the article. And there's a big section in the back where, you, if, you know, you can do a little bit home, more homework to find out more about whatever animal you're interested in. So, yeah, it was it was just not surprising. <laughs> you know, it, it was it was fun to sell a bunch of corals and I got a bunch of corals and to see a bunch of folks. Um, but it's just a little frustrating when, you know, seventy five dollars ultimate rasp guide ID everything. And so many people said dresses were their favorite. And only one guy who said he had been waiting for this opportunity to buy it in person after seeing it online for sale for like $600 because we had a few signed copies in the early days. And I don't know, someone selling a copy for, you know, big, big, big money. And he just walked up, plunked it down. <laughs> he was happy. <laughs> But they'll go spend 300 uh, bucks on a tiny frag, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing about the books is they're not going to die on you. I've had some of these books since I was a kid. Yeah. All right, do you think that's enough of warm-up to uh, tackle one of the biggest uh, news stories of the Reef Aquarium hobby this year? Sure, but I, got, I, think, I think you've got the insider knowledge. I'm a little bit more confounded by it and trying to understand it, but keeping an open mind about it as well, so... Well, that's why we make great co-hosts. There you go. If, you know, if, we, <laughs> if we both have the same point of view, what, what fun would that be, right? Yeah. So what's, you, what's your take, right? Because you're, you're purely a hobbyist. You've never been in the industry, but you've been around for a long time. What is your, again, well, gut reaction about it? Um, I, I guess I'm still, I mean, I've, I've, I've watched the videos and I've, I've read the, you know, everything there is about it. And I, I can see the BRS, I think it's Ryan's his name, right? I can see his point of view of why it made sense from his perspective. And I can also see maybe from a, I don't, I don't know Neptune's financials, right? But it, you know, any type of investment is probably beneficial on their side. So I can see that synergy, but it's also uh, intuitively just a, an odd matchup for me. Um, I'm optimistic about it. I have no negative. A lot of people got negative on the forums, and I, I'm not negative about it because I, I mean, 
I don't understand why there's a point to be negative or attack it, right? Because we, it's it's really you got to wait and see where things go with it, right? Like, you mm-hmm. got to give people the benefit of the doubt that the intentions are good and everything else. So, I don't I don't have anything negative to say. I just don't quite understand it because, um, I, I mean, I can go into the things I think are beneficial for it, but I can also tell you the things that I think may be concerning. Um, the one is they're a vendor that reviews products, right? So now they are a vendor that owns a company that makes pumps, that makes a controller, that makes lights. Um, Doser. Dosing. So Auto top off. How are they going to wade the water um, of, of, of trying to be objective and review other products, right? When they're in the business of probably of having well they're in a their vested interest is to make the best light right to make the best doser um so that part but i mean who's to say that they're going to continue that track of being both a retailer and tr- and trying to be a source of information you know unbiased information about products right um that was already a tricky water for them to wade anyway um so you know curious how that's going to play out Again, nothing negative. I'm just curious how they're going to deal with that. Um, uh, you know, how does this affect local fish stores and other retailers that sell Neptune, right? I mean, is it going to Im- Maybe it doesn't impact them at all, but uh, it's curious, right? Because now your competitor is the owner of the product that you're trying to sell. So that, that should be interesting. The pluses I have are... Uh, Neptune's got more scale, right, for research and development and building products. So maybe they can be faster to market, which would be cool for me because I feel like they're kind of lagging. Uh, the, the innovation could be a little bit better there. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be negative or critical. I just, you know, I'm a Neptune fanboy. I run Neptune products, but I've wanted to see more from them, right? Um, Maybe better interoperability with other manufacturers. Maybe BRS can push that agenda harder, right? Like I know the, I know that um, their ecosystem has become a little. I mean, I, I more locked down, and somebody's going to bring up uh, what was it, IOTA X or whatever. Um, but all right, let, let me let me weigh yeah. in on some of the things you've mentioned. Sure. And just so for people who are listening who have not been kept abreast of the developments this year, is I think it was later last year, or early this year, um, Bulk Reef Supply, um, the arguably the largest uh, retailer, uh, online retailer of marine aquarium products, um, they got a significant seven-digit, no, eight-digit investment, like a huge investment from a venture capital firm called Bertram Capital. And, you know, that made some, some waves when Reef Builders broke that story. And it was about a month ago, Bulk Reef Supply purchased uh, Marine Depot. And that sent everybody into a tizzy. And before, before Bulk Reef Supply got their investment, it was very clear that there was um, uh, quite a cozy relationship between Neptune Systems and bulk reef supply there nowhere is there more neptune systems branding uh besides the neptune systems website than on bulk reef supply like the logos for neptune on the bulk reef supply page before all of this happened were were bigger than the bulk reef supply logo it was it was interesting so like the, there was definitely um more than some hints that uh, you know there was a lot of friendliness going on there. So that's one of the things that makes me chuckle the most right now is you know these savants who have for two weeks or a month have predicted that Bulk Reef Supply was going to acquire uh, Neptune Systems when you know people who've been really paying attention have noticed this for like a year or two, and then when the Bertram Capital came through, they're like, yeah, that's probably a matter of time. I don't think Neptune Systems was. On on the market, proverbially, um, but you know somehow they they made it work, and I feel. You know, we're as humans, we're programmed to worry, before right. we rejoice, and everybody's talking about the sky is falling, the sky is falling is not good for the hobby, not good for the industry. But like, if we're if we're being honest, this isn't going to change anything for the consumer. It doesn't change how you keep a reef tank, does it? <laughs> 
No. <laughs> Does it change anything at all? <laughs> you still have to mix your seawater. You still have to manage your, your chemistry. Your corals don't care about bulk resupply and Neptune systems being under the same roof. They're like, all right, just tap the brakes. And I just want to remind people, and you would remember this, there's actually a bunch of precedents for this kind of consolidation in the aquarium hobby already, right? So I don't know who, who it was first, but it took a couple notes. But um, I guess when I was in college, so mid-2000s, uh, Central Garden and Pet is uh, one of the largest distributors of uh, pet products. Um, they bought Coralife. Oh, yeah, I remember major that. major yeah. brand, major brand at the time. Yeah. Like, like huge, huge brand. They offered a whole bunch of stuff, lights, pumps, additives, reactor media, protein skimmers, pumps. I mean, they had everything. Um, they bought Kent Marine. That was the biggest, you know, additive supplier at the time. It was a huge, huge deal. They bought All Glass Aquarium, the company that brought us the first, you know, metal lists you know unframed uh, glass tanks and they've since rebranded those to aquion and they also bought interpet which is a smaller brand but i, I believe that owns uh, that includes like api so a lot of test kits and 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 uh medications and different uh, aquarium water conditioners so that's central pet that's just one then there's spectrum brands so spectrum brands actually owns i think uh, like rayovac batteries and a lot of lifestyle brands and and just normal stuff you might find at the grocery store but they own tetra you know tetra was and is probably still the biggest manufacturer of fish foods in the world um they bought marine land marine land i'm talking about you know penguin power heads um emperor filters um hot magnum canister filters uh i believe perfecto was part of that I yeah I, I, yep um they bought instant ocean instant ocean Instant Ocean, um, uh, Sea Crystals, that's what it's called, right? The, the Reef Brand, Sea Crystals. Sea Crystals, the Reef Brand for Instant Ocean. Reef um, Crystals. Reef Crystals, there we go, Reef Crystals. And they bought Omega Sea, and you know, guess what? You can still find Kent Marine and All Glass Aquarium products, Aquion, Core Life, Tetra, Marine Land, Instant Ocean. Um, you can still get that stuff, except that now some of it is at the grocery store and a lot of it is at Petco slash PetSmart. You know, those brands were never like trailblazers. Maybe at once upon a time, Core Life was definitely more hobby centric with some more niche products. Um, but you can still get those brands. And you know what? You know, even if some of those brands stepped out of the uh, hobbyist consciousness i guarantee you they're selling more than ever um in front of even greater audiences across the world yeah yeah i was going to say those are much larger companies right much larger brands if you think about it like tetra for sure um coral life is still i i, I think pretty big if you think about it from a consumer mm -hmm. pet standpoint um yep. no yeah i agree i mean uh I don't think the sky is falling. I just thought it was an interesting acquisition. Um, I liked what he had to say about, you know, maybe coming out with a cheaper monitoring solution for mm -hmm. uh, beginning hobbyists. The, the Elmo? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, from a being the optimist point of view, it's like, yeah, if it reduces failure in beginner to intermediate or low budget hobbyists, if it reduces the loss of livestock, right, which paints mm -hmm. a better picture for the hobby. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that we live in it. I mean, we live in an age where everybody's got, you know, smart plugs on their light bulbs and stuff, even if they live in a tiny apartment, you know. So yep. um, I don't think the monitoring slash controller market is really like, you know, extreme hobbyist or the guy who, you know, spends thousands on his tank anymore. You know, I know you're not a big fan of controllers, but I... I I do think that they have a place for people who want them in, in you know, I mean, I, I think about people with nano tanks, right? They don't need a, a full apex, no. right? But something just they, to let them know, like, hey, there's a leak inside your stand or, hey, um, your top off is empty, you know, get, get off your couch and do something about it. Yeah, that's pretty cool to have. And if you yeah, can no, break I, into I, that market I, for 200 bucks, um, that's a good push I can, to Neptune. I can get on board with Ryan's um, strong feelings about yeah. having monitoring solutions. Totally. 
but I know what my five dollar Chinese, you know, Wi-Fi outlets can do for five dollars retail. Yeah. Right. And I've I've par- I've parsed out the the components, maybe not the R and D for the software side, and you should be able to put together a standalone smart pH. Uh, monitor, no screen, just Wi-Fi capabilities. Just log it to the cloud. Let me check on my on my phone for about twenty dollars. That ple- that you know, so that leaves plenty of room with packaging and, and software development and software and database uh, backending um, to bring something like that to market for like ninety nine dollars. And then you want to upsell me, a, you know, fifty dollar uh, screen so I can see it all the time. Awesome, dude. A hundred a hundred dollar smart pH probe uh, monitor with no screen and then $50 upsell for just the screen just so you know I can see it um I w- man I would buy five I would buy five like right freaking now and you have to have um a temperature sensor to have uh, accurate pH so you would get both of those in one um and then if you wanted to do another one for conductivity and uh you know a another one for water level sensor like you know it shouldn't be that expensive <laughs> you know yeah, my I mean concern and what will probably happen is like you know neptune system side they'll probably put together something for like three hundred dollars that does everything and it's like i don't need a three hundred dollar standalone monitor for each system with a screen and all these extra bells and whistles so if they can if they, they can trim the fat and this is something i really want to address and one of the things that has held Neptune systems back in the past is I mean they're not a small company but I feel they've had they have felt the need to take the Apple approach to having a walled in garden and sure like their wave pump and their skylight and their core pump will work without the Neptune systems controller but there's there's a lot of features that you're missing dude I would have a trident if it worked on its own like you, you, the communication radio to make that thing work would be like an extra couple bucks <laughs> it would be like an extra couple bucks you, there's no reason to m- force it to work with to, to, to operate having uh, um, uh, an apex controller Right, it's just uh, just a little bit more money to to make it work on its own. I'd be all about it. Now, if you wanted to, you know, then b- giving people the option to say, okay, you can monitor all your stuff with the Trident, but if you want an automatic controller stuff or uh, dosing, then you really need an Apex because that's what controls the doser. I, I totally get that. So I'm really hoping that with this purchase, Neptune Systems team and the direction that they get from bulk reef supply will give them a lot more breathing room because they they they'll be less um compelled to to create these artificial situations where you have to buy into the ecosystem that's that's my that's my strong opinions about it i really hope that's what we see yeah no i i mean i know it's a two-way street with vendors right i know um, if a vendor chooses to no longer make their light or pump interoperable with uh, Neptune, like uh, we can't fault Neptune for that, right? But if they do have this open API or IOTA, whatever, Reef IOTA, IOTA X, what I. Uh, uh, Internet of Things Aquariums, IOTA. There you go. Okay. Um, but you're a software guy. You know about open APIs. Tell I us do. what that would take. Well, and I'm, I, I won't even dive into that, but I mean, like, eat your own dog food, right? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> why not leverage that for some of your own integrations as well? And um, I, I don't know the – I, I don't want to be critical because I don't know the whole story. I'm not an insider. But um, I don't like that it has to be like a strategic partnership, right? Just open it up and let vendors – take their stabs at it right uh mm-hmm. that that's how open apis are right like hey we if you you know a, and then let the consumer sign his life away right one little box when you log into your apex like hey if you choose to have this pump uh work with uh, neptune and in your tank takes a dump you know it's not our fault right legal ula whatever and you're like if you choose to use our API, you agree, and then you check a little box, and like you, you know, you yeah. don't hold them accountable anymore. And then let us all get our hands dirty, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, there's so many that's sort of my for thing. this already. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, there, it, it always becomes sticky um, when two manufacturers have some degree of interoperability. Um, but one great example, and this might answer some long-standing questions people have had of why. Ecotech Marine Gear 
uh, the newer stuff does not work with the Neptune systems is because in the past their WXM module um, I think that's what it's called right mm -hmm. um, the, there's one for Vortech and one for AI when something didn't work do you think they call up Neptune systems or do you think they called up Ecotech Marine right. for the, v the vast majority of them would call it a Ecotech Marine because they saw it as an Ecotech Marine problem even though there was nothing wrong with the product that they were selling it was more the communication between that wireless chip and the, the Apex controller ecosystem you know so it always gets kind of super sticky it in, does in, in that way <coughs> but, excuse me but you know on the consumer end of stuff like uh, people just need a Drink a beer. <laughs> Just drink <laughs> a beer. Relax. Like the, the 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 fundamentals of keeping a reef tank are fine. There's a ton of precedents. You know, like when we were growing up, it was that fish place. Yeah, you know, that fish place was the catalog we looked out for. And then custom aquatic became huge. Then premium aquatic became huge. Then marine depot became huge. And now it's bulk reef supply. And we've been through this cycle long enough. Like, but marine bulk reef supply is not always going to be on top. You know, there's going to be a new angle and of doing business, not just online. There's going to be new economies, and there's going to be a, a, a new leader for the next generation. Um, so you know. It, Every time these things happen, like the Spectrum acquisitions, like the Central Pet acquisitions, th th there was no, <laughs> no harm to your existing reef tank and uh, ecosystem. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, again, I don't go to a lot of the conferences and stuff like you, you do, so I, I don't know Ryan or the rest of the BRS crew personally. But, I mean, just on a surface level, watching their videos, they seem like good dudes. And if those are the dudes that now sit around a conference room table with the Neptune guys and bounce ideas, that's not a bad thing. You know, like, that sounds mm -hmm. pretty cool. Uh, they're hobbyists. They're passionate. M my concern is they're, you know, it's, it's not a secret recipe that bh photo video uses a lot of data to have like the awesomest photography products it's no secret that amazon has a ton of data on their customers and that sure. thing you've had in your cart for a couple days when you hit click and it shows up the next day that's because amazon knew for a fact that you were going to order it and it's already you know halfway here and so my concern is you know all the most amazing products um in the aquarium hobby and from Apple and other electronics manufacturers, there were things you didn't know you wanted, right? So if they're guided solely by the data, we're just gonna get iterations of the same stuff. Yeah. You know, like putting together a monitor, that's, that's an idea that's like 20 years late. You know, just a standalone monitor, even a $300 box, if you have one tank and you wanna you know, monitor salinity, temperature, pH, conductivity, uh, that's the same as salinity, a water level, a couple other things. That's, that idea is super old. I could pull out my FAMAs right here from 1993 and the Octopus Aquadine did that for $800 plus some control V features and it would hit you on your pager. I, I'm gonna try to squeeze that into as many sessions of reef therapy as I can. So that idea is not, not, not at all revolutionary. But it would be really awesome to, to see them eat their own dog food with the whole Internet of Things aquariums and, uh, you know, open it up to, to small new manufacturers. Now, I, I really don't think the consumers should have anything to worry about. Yeah. The one super sticky spot is Bulk Resupply now owns a product line. How does that reflect on their conflicts of interest when they're reviewing any product right you know, and that's yeah I, I'm, that's i'm not that's trying to throw mark. shade i'm not trying to throw shade but reef builders is you know fully independent and when when bulk reef supply makes videos about products that they sell they don't have any room to inject any criticism right they'll tell you a, you know a little bit about the product they'll tell you kind of the basics and the fundamentals but they're all sort of infomercials i'm talking about the single spots not the one where they really dive in yeah i mean they to, kind of like admit, admit it right in one of their videos because they'll joke about if they say something bad about a product you know their sales team's going to come yell at them right because like well exactly, you just killed exactly. us our ability to sell that product and and so they've always waded that water and they've done it well i must add you know like uh that that tightrope or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it that knife edge they've, they've, they've done a good job so far but they're making it even trickier now because yeah they own a company that makes pumps and lights and controllers and dosers and you know 
I, I, I think it's, Ryan really, and we're talking about Ryan Bachelor. Um, you and, know, one and of the bigger heads. Let me just add, I don't think there's anything insidious in their reviews, right? No. Like, I don't think they're no. angling it. I don't think they would Absolutely purposely not. say, oh, Neptune's better than this, and here's why, because we want to sell more Neptune now. Like, I don't, I don't, I, they don't seem like those type of people, but in the best of worlds nobody's objective right like it's just yeah. it's human na- nature to that's that is so on point no there's there's very little objectivity we all are going to have some personal preferences but you know i only accept products to review that i know i'm going to like already yeah right i'm not s- spending a lot of energy spinning my wheels just dumping on crap that i don't like <laughs> that's not fun at all right but you know bulk reef supply has had to navigate you know, selling products and talking and reviewing them. And now, you know, one of their big pushes, they want to distribute a lot more, you know, to retailers. Like, if I was a retailer, I'm sorry, I would never buy wholesale products from Bulk Reef Supply. I know it would be easier to get everything you needed. You know, like Champion Lighting was that in the day. Man, I would buy all my normal stuff from Central Pet locally, and then all my reef kind of um, a boutique stuff uh, from Champion Lighting, you know, the, the, all the kinds of stuff that, that Central Pet didn't carry. And so, but it's, you know, Bulk Reef Supply is your main competitor. So, so buying from them, Bulk Reef Supply is your, more your main competitor than the guy down the street, like, except for livestock, yeah. you know. And, but so now that they own Neptune Systems, do you really want to carry Neptune Systems and then feed, feed them twice, you know, make them even stronger? That's a... You know what? You know what I think. Actually, I think there'll be a few stores who really care, and a few others who will just take the convenience, right? Like, I, like I've taken the convenience of buying from Amazon because I would go to store after store after store, not just aquarium stores, for random things, and they will all say, "Oh, I can order that for you." And you know, local stores have really dropped the ball of, of by and large, unless they're really committed to their craft. And you know, I've given up. I just buy from Amazon. I'm much rather buy local, but Amazon will get it to me faster than my local retailers. Yeah, um, I'm also curious what the other companies in the controller space are thinking not just the controller space because neptune systems now we're talking about a controller yeah monitor auto top off flow pump return pump refugium light uh automatic fish feeder did i mention doser now they got a skylight i must be missing something you know, uh, the automatic testing machine. Yeah, they're really so not a controller company anymore. They're an aquarium, reef aquarium product it, they company. They have right, the if you first think about it. fleshed out ecosystem of aquarium goods yeah. minus the glass aquarium. And so, yeah, it's not just a controller, right? If you're Kessel Ecotech Marine, you know, <laughs> I would just be exasperated, right? Because I'm sure Bulk Reef Supply is one of their largest vendors. And some smaller companies probably make a significant amount of their sales through bulk reef supply almost like a uh, amazon for for reef aquarium stuff but they're just not self-listed you know how does this affect their relationship with cj who makes flow pumps and return pumps how does this affect their relationship with all i mean with the marine depot purchase they also got aquamax uh skimmers and lights and media reactors right they've they've now they have a catalog of all their same brands i guarantee you we're gonna see some um probably the first of them will be some uh, some aquamax lights with just the right chip or the right you know cable to connect and talk to the apex hmm. right it'd be silly not to i mean it's gonna be a while before that kind of integration comes out it might be for future versions but yeah it's not just controller companies but if what's this we're talking about controller how how does ghl feel about you know having you know, selling to Bulk Reef Supply, which is now the owner of Neptune Systems. Like, how, how can they get fairly represented on that website? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that room to bring, <laughs> to bring up our third <laughs> guest on the show here uh, that I've seen visit you from time to time there. But, uh, no, yeah, uh, I do have to wonder, you know, like what they're thinking. And, again, I, I don't think that the motives of acquiring Neptune are 
you know, like I, I would like to think there's no master plan to, you know, take over the world it's like ne- everybody's thinking. That's never thinking. how it goes. Yeah. Amazon doesn't set up to shut down stores. Walmart's not set no, up to shut down stores. Amazon just owns you- companies that make Wi-Fi routers. They they own uh, companies that make cameras, right? I think they they like they have a they've got the Blink cameras. Ring? They own Ring, yep. but they still sell competitor products, right? So yeah, um, it's not like the first time that that weirdness has happened um but it is you know uh, it does I, i'm sure it does put those manufacturers like coral view and ghl on notice a bit like hmm okay you know that's something we got to think about yeah I, you know there's 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 a consumer side i think is going to be fine the retailer side is kind of going to be the say the same i'm sure it'll be a complicated relationship buying from your main competitor um, but I think the stickiest relationship is going to be between the suppliers um, and Valkyrie Supply because, you know, you, you, it takes no imagination to know already that Valkyrie Supply has been, you know, using their clout and their size to try to get the best deals, to try to get the most inventory, to just, you know, shave off as much expense and cost of everything that they acquire. That's natural. Everyone would do that and if, if they were if it, they had the opportunity. Yeah. Right? That's just a super natural human thing to do. You want to get things for the best price, get more stock than your competitor, get it suited in your competitor. And so um, here's the thing. I don't, I don't think any of these, these uh, manufacturers are surprised, right? Like, yeah. they got a huge investment. Like, what are you going to do with tens of millions of dollars? You know, you got to do, <laughs> do something. <laughs> and this is, this is not a surprise. And it's, but it is, like, um, kind of a wake-up call. But I don't think it came with Neptune Systems. I think it came with, you know, before even the purchase of Marine Depot. Um, and here's the, here's the, the, the silver lining. I really think some of these companies have been riding the wave, you know, of just success and and coronavirus uh, boost to aquarium exposure and the popularity of it and business as usual. But now that Neptune Systems is going to have a lot more resources to do more things quicker, um, you know, Ecotech Marine, they've put out a lot of products, but they're, they're... (laughs) They're not even like, a, a, you can't expect them to put out new stuff once a year, right? You know, sometimes it might be a few years, like the Vortec MP40. I mean, that hasn't been updated since the Quiet Drive. When, when, when was that? <laughs> Four or five years ago? Not that they need to, but now there's just a healthy amount of competition to maybe wake some of these companies out of their complacency. Yeah. I think it will. Um, and I also sort of like what you said earlier about um, sometimes the best products are the ones we couldn't even imagine needing, right? Versus just like, oh, our data points suggest that we should come up with a better this. Um, for companies to develop and put out their things that, that you haven't even really thought about needing and suddenly you go, oh, you know, that's pretty cool. And then a month later, you're like, how did I live without this? Yes. Um, a company needs to be able to make mistakes, which means they need more money, right? They need mm-hmm. to be able to yep. afford mistakes. You know, Apple's R&D budget is insane, right? They right. could make a total flop It's the GDP product of like that, five small countries. Right. If they come up with a product and everyone says it's stupid and they made a billion of them, they'd be like, okay, let's go back to the drawing <laughs> board, you know? But that could be complete and utter failure for another company. So if this um, lets Neptune... Um, get a little more ballsier, you know, about trying new products and putting stuff out there, um, that would be good news, right? I I, I feel like they, um, I felt like Trident was actually pretty cool. So I'll make an exception for that in terms of uh, putting something out there. It should have been standalone. But But, but they didn't have, but they wanted to tie people into the ecosystem up front. You know, it's like forcing somebody to do something instead of enticing them to do something. Like say, all right, you can use the Trident. You can have all your values reported, but you're not going to be able to manage them um, automatically in a smart way unless you plug into the Neptune and and get the dose. You know, so I I definitely prefer the carrot versus the stick or the upfront marriage versus later on you decide you really love it and then you want to invest more. So those are some of the decisions I'm I'm going to be really uh, uh, hoping to see more in the future some standalone products you know and 
I, I know it's again supernatural to you know on on their end on the bulk reef supply and neptune systems end to paint this like it's all unicorn and rainbows and it's going to be so great for everybody and again i don't think it's gonna be doom and gloom but um it'll be really interesting to see what some of their i think their first step is going to be one of the most interesting right because they're going to have yeah. to do something i don't know just powerful or just something that you know really makes an impression and gets people excited about about things and um you know i don't i don't think a 300 hundred dollar monitor is going to be that great you can buy a used apex for 300 dollars that'll do the exact same thing you know yeah they've got it they've got to show i guess a return on that investment right that they've just received so they've got to show some progress and i'm sure they've had some products on the back burner that they would love to have done but maybe it was refreshing to have them talk about it. Yeah. Right? They were talking about the Trident 2 on the stream yeah. um, to test, I guess, phosphate and nitrate. And I was, I was racking my brain to be like, well, what else would you do? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but, that, but then that would also just be the same Trident machine with different reagents in it. It wouldn't really be something totally new. But I don't know what the third thing would be to test. I don't any, know. Any thoughts besides nitrate and phosphate? I don't really test anything, so... <laughs> <laughs> I just look at my corals um, and go, huh. And hearing them talk about the EL, because they have the Apex EL, yeah. which is a, you know, a light version, and then it turned into the Elmo for the EL monitor. Um, that's interesting. But, man, $300 monitor, again, that's just not going to impress I, I'll too tell you many where folks. I would love for them to spend money, but they won't because it's, there's no ROI for them, I think, to do it. Maybe in the sense of less warranty claims, but... Um, Build something robust that's built to be around water, right? Uh, USB cables. Ooh. Ooh, um, yeah. The way the way things plug in, the housings. You 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 open these things up like they're not marine grade, right? Like if you're they at least if you love your apex, you don't put it right above your sump, right? Yeah. Uh, you you put it in the dry cabinet. Um, I assume it's got a conformal coating on the PCB at least. On the what? On the printed circuit board has the conformal coating to just kind of repel moisture. You haven't, you didn't look that close. I mean, uh, I desoldered my broken EBA 32 and I didn't see any coatings on it. Um, so mm, maybe, mm, mm, mm. I don't know. Um, yeah. but uh, you know, I would just like to see it a little more Marine grade, I guess, uh, in terms of, 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 you know, how they build some of that stuff. But again, there's no ROI. That's just going to make it more expensive on their part or they have to charge us more, but um that that's just my own thing is that i would love to see that but um well i have a few more thoughts but i think like this is a great time to stimulate our listeners and viewers if you're watching us on youtube tell us like i yeah. would love like sincerely i am not fishing for comments i would sincerely love to know what people would love to see first would you like to see um, a smart Aquamax protein skimmer with some Neptune systems interoperability. Would, you know, do you want something completely different? Um, do you want a smart heater, right? BRS made their own heater with uh, um, Shago and Inkbird, mm -hmm. right? So it'd be nice to maybe have a standalone. I, I want to see standalone products, man. I just want to see standalone products. I, I don't want, uh, they could make everything fun and smart. Um, that's my point, but I would love to see what people w w would like to see themselves. Like I have a, I have a fifty dollar uh, wireless uh, Tetra, Tetra automatic fish feeder, right? The wired version from uh, Neptune Systems is a hundred dollars. The wireless version from Tetra is fifty dollars. You know, it's like I, there's some there's some middle ground right there. So isn't the, everything um, that's possible. Isn't the Neptune one just a rebranded Lifeguard Aquatics? Um, cause I have them both and I'm like, these look oddly similar. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a cool hopper, you know, system, but it's, you know, a two X premium. Yeah. Over but the again, it's, it's a USB connection right above the water. Uh, it's just a power. It's just, it's just turning it on. Even it if might you put some well rubber grommets on it, like Kessel does with their USB C, right? They come with these nice rubber sealable grommets that just seal everything up for you. I don't know. Yeah. That's so with all these concerns about the consolidation of the reef aquarium industry and certain things like i just want to remind everybody like first of all there's a lot of companies in the aquarium hobby that are independent there's a lot of vendors including saltwateraquarium.com premium aquatics 
um, Aqua Cave. Um, that you know they'll sell you products too. Uh, what's another one? Um, aquarium Specialty, um, Aquarium Partners. There's a lot of companies you can buy from. You know if you feel you're buying from the big back boogeyman. So there's still a lot of selection. Um, but there's also a lot of fun small brands. You know small brands that are doing one thing and one thing well. I, I just really I haven't. I'm setting up to use to install my Refi uh, LED light. Man, they have a 185 watt LED about the size of a uh, um, an XR15 Gen 5, uh, and it's 369 for yeah. 185 watts. It's got a ton of LEDs. It's got individual lenses. It's got a vapor, you know, cooled heat sink. It's got a built-in color screen for like letting you know what the light is doing. It's got a you know controllable app. You know, these are some of the small upstart American-made companies that you can support as uh, you know your reaction to. Uh, uh, this globalization within the American reef aquarium industry. There's a lot of smaller brands out there that are that are crafting, that are really designing new stuff. There's also a lot of black box Chinese LEDs that are getting a label stuck on them and claiming <laughs> to be something special. We're not going to shame those, but if it looks like a black box, it is a black box. They just spec'd out the LEDs and told them where to put the fans. <laughs> you know, it's just that. There's a, there's a lot of other options that that, that you can. Uh, support yeah and i i don't know for me personally speaking it's a hobby you know so yes. uh, don't Why don't don't choose your hill to die on don't like yes. is it really worth getting all activists about oh my god you know this vendor bought this manufacturer and uh, to me it's like it's okay if that's you know that 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 outrage gets you excited and whatever. And if that's where you get your joy, okay. But at the end of the day, man, there's so much in the world that I'm stressed out about already. Like this is just a hobby and I just want to enjoy my Neptune controller. And if bulk reef supply has what I'm looking for and my local fish store doesn't, then I may shop there, you know, and I'll watch the BRS videos knowing in the back of my mind that they're probably not the most objective place to get information, but they're still entertaining guys, right? Um, I'd still have a beer with them. So I don't know. Just, you know, it's, um, I, I think it's important to remember it's a hobby and don't get too riled up about stuff like that. That's what I was trying to convey. You, you placed, play, said it more eloquently. How you keep a reef tank doesn't change. If you buy instant ocean, you're already buying, you're, if you use Instant Ocean, you're already buying from, you know, a mega corporation listed on the stock exchange. If you have an all glass aquarium, yeah. the brand, or Aquion Aquarium, you're buying from a, you know, a stock, uh, US stock exchange listed company. You know, um, if you have a Seaclone or Maxi Jets or an Emperor Pro Filter or, you know, any of these number of things, you are buying from, you know, the you know, previous generations of major merger acquisitions that the aquarium hobby has seen. And guess what? It, product still works. Everything's fine. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I'm probably know. a hypocrite because, you know, obviously we've expressed our outrage about how corals are named and priced at times. So we, we, we have our own bones to pick in the hobby as well. And maybe somebody. That's the hill that I'll die on. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is what words actually right. mean and what names actually mean. If, if you know, I don't want to say talk bad about anybody, but uh, Steve Tyree was here the other day. He's here on Sunday after the show, invited him. We had a great time, but it was a little, um, perplexed or kerfuffled when he pointed out my milka stylo and called it the grape ape stylophora i'm like no sir no this coral is the oldest documented stony coral strain i think it's 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 like neck and neck with the stuber acro right and he's calling it the grape ape i'm like come on man how dare <laughs> this is you the milka sir <laughs> this is like 35 <laughs> years old collected from the red sea do your homework you know and that's the thing if you're not keeping up with the scientific names the actual names and you're not keeping up with the trade names, then what do we have? Yeah. What do we have? No, but it was cool to have Tyree here and just kind of uh, talk about some classic coral strains and, you know, show off some of the displays. And he was really enjoying my uh, mangrove tank. It kills me. It kills me how much work some of the other tanks are. So many more corals, 
so many so many more fish going on and then the mangrove tank i've got Everyone five gravitates. colonies of, of <laughs> yeah i've got five colonies of, of of larger montes and i have i don't know six mangrove trees popping out I and mean, just the way it's spotlit and it's just just to have this above and below water everybody goes to that tank like oh i made it too good how do i make my euphilia tank shine that hard how do i make my mixed or my lps or my acro tank how do i make those shine that hard or but no, it was cool. It was cool talking to him about some classic strains and the early days of the hobby. Um, he had hit the road, so he wasn't here that long. But it, it was kind of cool just to get a bounce off some stuff off of him. But yeah, coral names really matter. We're going to go knock it down that road. Um, I, I think my overarching thoughts, like I, I have never gotten this many calls, messages, DMs, emails about anything that's happened in the aquarium hobby ever. And I just told everybody, wait, wait till reef therapy. We're going to all get it out there. And there's no reason to cast any kind of judgment until they do something. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, somebody asked me about it and I said, okay, well, th there's three outcomes, right? Um, specific to the Neptune acquisition, not around this whole, oh, is it a monopoly? Which they're not, you know, they're not even close. But um, one, they make Neptune better. Okay, that's great. Uh, one, Neptune, they keep a hands off approach and Neptune stays the same. Yeah, okay, you know, that's not bad either. Or they run Neptune in the ground right okay well then there's other controllers on the market that will fill that void right like it's a niche right in an ecosystem if, if the species goes extinct that dominated it another species will take over that niche in that ecosystem so mm -hmm. there's no end of the world scenario right like it's just an it's just <laughs> interesting to observe right life goes That's on the statement of the podcast there is no end of the world scenario just cool your jets yeah um I have been a detractor of Neptune systems because I don't want to see another plastic box with wires hanging out. You know, it's just, just the same as the Octopus Aquadine um, from 30 years ago. Very little has changed. And I, I hope this gives them, if they have, you know, the ability, I hope it gives them the opportunity to stretch their wings and truly innovate like the Trident. You know, Trident really is in a class of its own. And I just, I just want to see them be able to do more of that and not feel the need to lock any of their users into their you know, walled in garden. That, that's, that's what I want to see. But again, there's, there's no reason to, you know, there's no end of the world scenario. But I'm also super excited about this, you, you know, encouraging some of the other manufacturers to, to hustle a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I think like uh, I know Ecotech could bring could build such amazing products. You know, uh, CJ has got a ton of design chops. Um, Kessel makes some great lights. What if they you know started dabbling in other things? Um, I, and I hope that we see a little bit more of this. Yeah, you know, we might see some stuff come that's been stuck in the the skunk works, right? And and suddenly it's like, all right, let's make a bold decision and put this thing to market. You know, let's let's mm -hmm. try to gain a foothold and. That'd be interesting. It, uh, that's that's the the gist of it for me. Is is I was a bit confounded by it. And I was trying to understand it. Uh, uh, but if it really just boils down to the things that Ryan talked about, you know, about how they're just passionate about the product and they want to help make it better, uh, invest money into it, grow it. Cool. All right. I believe everything that Ryan is saying. Yeah. I, I, he is, he's a sincere dude, um, but he's not the only dude. You know, there's a lot of people at the at the round table now and best laid plans can lead in lots of different directions. And until they make a first move and honestly, a few moves, there's no indication. E even they don't know. They don't right. even know where they're, go they're, they're going to end up. Right. They have best laid plans. They're super optimistic about the future. But even they don't know how this stuff is going to land and and what they're going to be able to achieve. But the Elmo. I'm talking to you, Terrence, and I'm talking to you, Ryan. That is not the solution. They'll just give me a smaller box with just a few, you know, plugs hanging out of it because a used Apex is the same price. Well, I, I don't think it's hard. F I don't think it would be hard to build because you're just deconstructing an Apex, right, uh, into mm. something less. Um, but I do think there's a market for it. I mean, um, I'll relate to Ryan on this. I had a reef keeper, right? It didn't do a yeah, whole yeah, lot, that was, but that was I liked cool it. About, yeah. yeah, and if you if they can build something for two hundred bucks, I I wouldn't be surprised if it sold. You know, um, especially yeah. for people that don't want to program a bunch of crap. They just want to know if there's a damn leak or the temperature's too high or the pH yeah. went out of whack. That's great. Like 
you know, uh, some people are like, I just need you to tell me to get off the couch and go fix it. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just an insurance policy. Yeah, an insurance policy. Um, sort of yeah, like putting fun, a webcam in your house when you go on vacation. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it, but the information that you have, at least you can pick up the phone and be like, hey, man, I noticed there's something going on in my house. You yeah. know, like, hey, I noticed the, te- the temperature's too high. Oh, yeah, I went into your, your neighbor tells you, hey, yeah, it looks like your AC died. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right, let me call the AC company. You know, like just little things like that could really be beneficial. If it's a low cost of entry where you're like, yeah, the benefits of having that information are worth 200 bucks to me. Right, but yeah. man, I wish there was macro this year. So you know, because this is a few months out, this would be a few months out, and it would be Atlanta. Yeah, so get what the, the hell? Again, and we'd be able to bounce all the stuff off of everyone in the industry and just get a race. Uh, tempered feedback after a yeah. few months of contemplating on it, not just sitting there reacting on a keyboard. Um, so th- I'm going to be I'm going to be missing Magna this year. I was definitely uh, uh, I wish I wish it was happening and I wish it was happening in Atlanta. But yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. But in the meantime, you nailed it on the head. There is no end of the world scenario. Your reef tank still operates the same. I'm not. A, it's funny because I I might be one of the biggest control freaks because I can make everything in the studio dance. But I don't need a controller to do it. The only downside is I have a page of different apps. Yeah. But I'm proficient enough now to navigate them uh, faster than if they were all on one app. For, frankly, there's some apps that are just so slow or too many nested menus that it, sometimes it takes a lot longer to, f- to access different things within one app than all the devices that I use I- within different apps. And that is firmly a first world problem. Now, <laughs> I will say this, and I will hunt Ryan down if this happens. If I go into my <laughs> oh Neptune boy. Fusion and they're like there are pop-up ads for BRS in my Neptune Fusion Ooh. or a little widget like, hey, looks like you could use a new heater. You know, like I'm Ryan. I'm coming for you, Ryan. Make, <laughs> make it happen on April first, just for a day. That'd be so fun. <laughs> it's like my wife's Kindle, right? Like she turns it on and it does little ads and stuff. It's well, she must have got one of the cheap yeah, ones that was subs- yeah. subsidized with ads. Oh, yeah. But it'd be so funny if everybody's Fusion app on April first said, "Hey, Mark, looks like you could use a new heater." <laughs> <laughs> little BRS ad pops up on my Fusion. <laughs> no, it, I wanted to say Mark on everyone's. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Vanderwall. I'll be like, you damn you, you, Ryan. <laughs> anyway. Cool. Well, on that uplifting note, I think this has been um, it's been nice to get it out there because so many people have been just blasting me about it. I'm like, all right, we're going to put all our thoughts into one re-therapy session. Um, thanks to everyone for listening. Yes. Uh, if you are listening on your favorite podcasting app, make sure to, um, what are we supposed to do? Oh, yeah, review us. <laughs> review us, you know, let us know how we're doing. And if you have any thoughts about this in general, just take a breath before you make a comment <laughs> on YouTube. And uh, this will, should be a very engaging discussion uh, here on Reef Therapy. So Agreed. thanks again for joining me, Mark. Thank and, you, Jake. Uh, we'll do it again very soon. All right, man. We'll talk soon. See you. All right, bye, everyone.